So, Karina, I think your mm -hmm. patient is first. Oh, yes. So, my first uh, patient is a patient with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. It is um, female, 55 years old, athlete. She has a clinical history of paroxysmal AF since five years ago. Um, she suffers from uh, episodes of AF twice a month, duration five to ten hours. ERA function class is 2A, mild symptoms. Uh, she has a pill in the pocket strategy with flecainide, 300 milligrams, once the AF appears, and uh, usually cardioverts within 30 or 40 minutes. And at times, she feels dizzy for, uh, while the AF is uh, cardioverting. Uh, she has a sinus bradycardia, 40 to 50 beats per minute. Her desire is to stop antiarrhythmic drug, um, and she is referred for pacemaker therapy related to the symptoms she suffers with bradycardia and the dizziness uh, with the pill in the pocket strategy. So what to offer this patient? Should we uh, give her a pacemaker, or should we instead refer her to AF fibrillation? Good. To me, um, the, the case is, is quite clear. It's a relatively young uh, woman, an athlete, very active person uh, with uh, symptomatic atrial fibrillation, symptomatic enough to, to qualify for, for enterythmic uh, drug therapy on a pin in the pocket basis. Uh, the, the sinus bradycardia, to me, is uh, more resulting from the, from the good physical status uh, of the patient, and I don't see uh, the requirement for, for a pacemaker uh, in this patient. If we, if we consider the, opportunity, the option of pacemaker implantation in a 55-year-old female with, uh, I would say, a weak indication, I don't see any benefits uh, we, we need to consider that the patient has, for the next 30 years, to live with all inconveniences and also, also all complications of the implant. So I would not do it to my sister, yeah. no. <laughs> we won't go there, but I think this, the pacemaker is the last thing that this particular woman wants. Yeah. As Goethe has just said, she's rather young, um, very active. If she was 20 years older and had a sinus bradycardia 40 to 50, you mm -hmm. would raise the question potentially of sinoatrial disease, where the pacemaker approach might have a little bit more merit. But nevertheless, even then, I think an ablation would be the first thing to try. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, she's a perfect candidate for a PVI. Yeah. So well, Karina, what, what did you we do? We agree, I agree. Well, she was referred for AF ablation and did fine. She has had no recurrences and uh, goes on living a very good life. Yeah. Did you put her on, on anticoagulation after ablation? No. 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 Yeah. No. Good. I, I, I think that uh, that's important. These we patients. kept it for three months yeah. because and then, you never know if yeah. she recurs. Yeah. So and then you take it off. And then you take it off. Excellent. So. Yeah. yeah. So these patients really benefit from, yeah. from yeah. Uh, uh, ablation. And uh, I have the feeling that as these patients have from their clinical characteristics a low risk profile, that it may be a good idea to uh, approach them with the idea of ablation earlier, better earlier than late. We've talked a little bit about the role of ablation as mm -hmm. first line, and actually this kind of patient is, is the perfect example Absolutely. for considering mm -hmm. that, I think. Yeah. Okay, next patient. I think it's one of yours, Gert. Yeah, this is one of ours. And uh, this shares with you the, the uh, Holter recording that we, that we got from that patient after we came up with a, the with a diagnosis of paroxysmal uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, <clears throat> as you can uh, see the, from the frequency profile uh, of the patient, the, the, this patient uh, had recurrent episodes uh, of uh, high ventricular rates due to atrial fibrillation. These very, very often these on and off uh, uh, AF phenomena that make the patient highly symptomatic. We talk about a 46-year-old uh, teacher with no known structural uh, heart disease, a, a healthy guy. He complained of palpitations for the first time in 2011. The palpitations were only of very short duration, sometimes only, only seconds, and they were never captured in 
any type of, uh, of ECG um, recordings. However, in, in 2013, when he had longer episodes of uh, palpitations, he went to see his physician and atrial fibrillation was documented. For two, one or two years, uh, the situation remained manageable and uh, very stable, but then the patient had uh, uh, an increase in the number, frequency, and the duration of atrial fibrillation uh, episodes to, to weekly episodes. In 2016, he had a presyncope um, after, as he described it, uh, termination of the arrhythmia, stop of the palpitations, um, before he regained uh, sinus rhythm. So what are the treatment options for, for this patient who has never seen any antirhythmic drugs, he has not seen a beta blocker uh, or any other specific medication. No treatment is something that we always should consider in, in medicine. I believe that this is an, op an option that is uh, not uh, considered uh, significantly enough in many, many settings, a beta blocker, conventional beta blocker low-risk uh, treatment, antirhythmic drug uh, treatment, um, or catheter ablation. Before we discuss this, I would like to remind all of us that the, the outcome goal in these patients always need to be defined. Outcome is so relevant. What do we, do we want to change for, for the patients? There are always two key questions that, that I address together with my patient. One is the question, Will we, will we improve quality of life? And the other is, will we improve quantity of life? And I believe that with any intervention, one of the two questions should, should be answered with a clear yes. Better if we can answer both questions with a, with a clear yes before we proceed in any intervention. So what are we going to do with this teacher, Karina? <clears throat> well, weekly episodes, quite frequent, so mm -hmm. I don't think no treatment is an option. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you would have to discuss very thoroughly with the patient what the alternatives are. I think you should always do that. Um, I would um, propose a beta blocker after informing the patient the side effects after informing the patients what the complication rates are with AF ablation. Mm -hmm. And if the patient resists, mm -hmm. I, of course, would also consider a first-line uh, treatment with AF ablation. But I would probably start off with a beta blocker. And if that fails, I would recommend AF ablation in, in this case. Do you have any concerns on a beta blocker about the presyncope post-termination? Yeah, that could be a problem, mode? but on the other hand, if, if uh, the patient receives a beta blocker, that better regulates the heart rate, so the syncope may disappear. I, I think it's a, a, a beta blocker uh, is, a, uh, <coughs> is a therapeutic uh, option although the patient has this one has had this one one episode that i see completely uh, like you i personally uh, have to say that uh, i don't like the beta blockers too much as their their impact in in quality of life is is significant especially some patients tolerate it then some patients yeah. tolerate it if they must tolerate it but uh, <laughs> for 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 the younger patients uh, beta blocker is is more of a problem so i think this is a good case to to promote patient engagement and and shared shared decision making many many patients uh, can can clearly understand that the different uh, therapeutic options that are on the table and uh, they can decide what they would like as their preference. I can very well recall when we, in 2010, for the first time ever, introduced the, the uh, um, patient choice uh, symbol into, into the, uh, the guidelines, that it was also uh, commented uh, with, with uh, some, uh, I would say, refusion or rejection from, from the physician side. But it's, it's a good approach, and the patient plays a key role in the decision-making process. So we offered to the patient beta blocker. We offered uh, flaconide uh, therapy, and I agree with you. Continuous treatment does make more sense if you, if you are dealing with uh, weekly episodes or catheter ablation. With the goal, the outcome goal, improvement of quality of mm, life. Yeah. 
The patient underwent ablation. Uh, he had a recurrence, unfortunately, a couple of weeks after the, the ablation uh, procedure and underwent uh, one more reablation procedure and is currently doing fine. So you reablated after an episode of two weeks, which is well within the three-month blanking period. Um, so mm -hmm. are you regarding the three-month blanking period as one for scientific purposes, mm -hmm. or do you apply it clinically? Mm -hmm. No, we, we performed the ablation uh, in, in the window uh, more than three months after the initial okay. ablation, pre uh, period, uh, ablation timing. Um, I believe that, that uh, both is true. Early recurrence predicts late recurrence. If you see a patient with a recurrence early after the ablation, keep an eye on him or her. The likelihood that you will see them again with recurrences is significantly higher as compared to the patients with a clean early ablation follow-up. But on the other side, it's also true that in patients with early recurrence, late cure may occur. So it's always advisable uh, to wait at least three months, uh, then rediscuss uh, with the patient and, and then take the decision. There are only very few exceptions, mainly in patients with, with advanced structural heart disease, where you convert atrial fibrillation into otherwise untreatable left atrial macroentrant mm -hmm. uh, tachycardia with, with <coughs> ventricular rates of 140. Uh, beats per minute that all do not, time. yeah, all the time, yeah. and then, then you have to re intervene. Quite rare with PVI only. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, but this is also due to the fact that in, in most centers, the, the, the PVIs uh, with cryo uh, were uh, performed in patients without significant structural heart disease. Okay, two cases of paroxysmal AF indicating how successful PVI can be. We now have a couple of cases of persistent, which mm -hmm. I hope to fit in before we have to leave. So, Karina. Yeah, the next uh, case is a patient with persistent AF, 65-year-old male patient, post-myocardial infarction. He has had heart failure since two years, neurocart association function class 2, era class 3. Of course, sometimes difficult to differentiate uh, what is what. Left ventricular ejection fraction 0.3. Uh, left atrial size 5.5 centimeters. He has a clinical history of AF since one year only. Cardioverted every second to third month. He has had previous thyroid disease and amiodarone is contraindicated. It was a thyroid toxicosis. So what to offer this patient with persistent AF and heart failure? AV ablation for rate control and CRT pacemaker, or go for AF ablation. The patient uh, has expressed a desire for AF ablation. I think this is a difficult clinical scenario. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, it's, and it, it brings us to the, the second most frequent clinical scenarios where, where decision-making on, on therapeutic strategy uh, is, uh, is, is needed, frequently needed. The prevalence of heart failure mm -hmm. incre has increased over the last year. It will further increase over the next year. So it's so important to, uh, to focus on this subset of, uh, of patients. And the key question when it comes to the, to the explanation of the symptoms is, is the patient symptomatic because of the atrial fibrillation or is the patient symptomatic because uh, of his structural heart disease and, and heart failure uh, state. He's post-myocardial infarction, so he has a significant structural heart disease on the ventricular level. This reduces a little bit the likelihood that he may profit symptom-wise from rhythm control uh, strategy, but it, it does not exclude it. Um, so the, but I have a question along mm -hmm. that. Be cardioverted every second or third month, which suggests that there were six, eight, yeah. ten week periods of sinus rhythm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. How yeah. was yeah. he? He yeah. improved okay. after yeah. cardioversion. So okay. that's why we could give, yeah, okay. we could evaliate the and function his, class for heart failure. Did his ejection fraction AF. improve in those times? Was there any? No, it was the same. Ah, mm. okay. But it's a short time also, three it, it months is, to it improve. Is. So but nevertheless, it would maybe, have been nice to see. Yeah. Yeah. And the left atrial size, obviously, is larger than you'd like for an ablation. Yeah, well, 5.5. Okay, that's your... So, 
But those are the issues, aren't they? Those mm -hmm. sort of. Um, well, there, there, there is, uh, <coughs> there is amido There would be, in general, an amidarone uh, opportunity for this patient that mm -hmm. I don't like. In this patient, it's not a, it's not a an opportunity. He's quite yeah. young. Yeah. He's yeah. sixty-five. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. not an yeah. elderly patient. Um, Pacing so. the blade. AV nodal ablation and, and CRT. I mean, the, the, the patient uh, would qualify for primary prevention, mm -hmm. yeah. post myocardial infarction. I don't like it. I, I have to say, uh, pace and pace and the blade. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would not be my preference, especially considering the age of the patient mm -hmm. uh, of 65. We have a saying that the patient's always right. Yeah. And he wanted an ablation. Yeah. So what what did you do? Well, he's still on the waiting list, so, oh. so it's not yet. So. so we don't have an answer. No, we don't yeah. have an answer. The next webinar, you can let us know. But I, th I think that is a reasonable. So it's a, he was put on a waiting list for a ablation. It's a very but, interesting, uh, and that's a classically, there are lots of dilemmas here in making the decisions. And I think it's an extremely good case to, to show. I mean, you always have, a, it doesn't uh, a ablation yeah. function, or if it's a failure after two k trials. You can always proceed with Yes, it doesn't prevent anything yeah. else, I agree. And if, if we take uh, uh, into consideration the, the data from, from uh, Nassir Marouche, the, yeah. Yeah. the, the Castle AF trial, yeah. sure. uh, it, it would strengthen the, the yeah. Uh, yeah. position of, of uh, mm, absolutely. atrial fibrillation. Yeah. We're uh, running a little out of time. If we can quickly look at Gert's oh, yeah. patient, yeah. just to... So, we, we stay in the field of... Uh, patients with, with uh, structural heart disease, and we uh, come out with a 70-year-old uh, retired officer. Um, he has, he's a typical German, so he's quite <laughs> obese. He has hypertension, diabetes, reduced kidney function uh, with a, filter, a filtration rate of 44 milliliters uh, per minute. A couple of years ago, he underwent, cath he underwent uh, uh, invasive uh, coronary angiography that excluded uh, uh, ischemic heart disease, and he ended up with a diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy. The left ventricle is dilated with end diastolic dimension of 68 millimeters. Left ventricle ejection fraction is, uh, is 28 percent. AF has been documented for quite a while, so he is long-standing persistent. We, in 2015, um, during a routine check, uh, when he was when he when he saw his cardiologist, so he did not uh, approach the cardiologist with palpitation or any significant worsening of of symptoms. It was one of the one of the routine uh, checks. His mean ventricular rate was 86 beat beat per minute, so he was, I would say, okay with rate control. He has uh, a QS complex of 110 10 milliseconds. Um, in, the, in the last three months, there was a significant clinical uh, decrease in exercise uh, capacity, and now he turned out to be uh, New York Heart Association class three, which is a significant impairment yeah. in, in quality of that. <coughs> if, once you're class three, you really yeah. lose something which is important. So I'm afraid we have to be quick here. Karina, what are your thoughts very oh, quickly? Oh, this is a very difficult case, I think. Quite a common case, but yeah. difficult. Um, I think I would... Uh, hmm. Rate control is pretty good. 86 not bad. beats per minute. Yeah. It's not very bad. I don't know what, how he's doing while he's strenuous exercise. Um, I think I would go for AV node ablation and uh, a CRT. A CRT pacemaker. CRTD, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. CRTD. What would have been a good opportunity for him? We put him back, back in, in sinus rhythm in order to explore whether there will be any benefit uh, from sinus rhythm in, in that patient and to, to uh, discern yep. between heart failure related it's symptoms. It's always worth doing if you yeah. can. Yeah. Oh, he has not been cardioverted. No, he has not oh, been cardioverted. Okay. He has I not would been definitely do that, yes. yes. Okay. And uh, patients without, he, he underwent an MRI, he has no fibrosis on a ventricular level, so okay. the, the likelihood of improvement in left ventricular function mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in this subset of patients is higher as compared to post myocardial yes, infarction yes. Uh, patients. So if he improves, we would give it a try with, with catheter ablation. It's important to remember that the dilated cardiomyopathy is often secondary to the AF, not uh, because of, not the AF secondary to it. And I've, mm. I've, I've, I hadn't appreciated that 
the DC County version had not been tried, but I, I completely agree mm. with that. It's, uh, it's yeah, important to know. Yeah, I think that should be tried first, mm -hmm. absolutely, yeah. yes. Hmm. So that's still work yeah, that's in progress? Yeah, that's, that's work in progress. It's okay. still pending. We will see how he, uh, how he develops, and, and then we will uh, treat him accordingly. In that case, we really are running out of time, and so I'll have to now bring this session to a close, firstly by thanking Karina and Gert for their fantastic talks. Um, I hope you've all realized that AF management involves making individual patient decisions, highlighted by these last examples, where we can select from a number of therapeutic options that aren't necessarily relevant to all AF patients. There is no one size that fits all in AF. The role of ablation, however, is clearly increasing. And from our point of view, this side of the table, we would all like to be referred AF patients early in the course of the disease when any of the therapies are likely to be more effective. Thank you all for your attendance, and I hope you found it to be worthwhile. Goodbye for now.